Hi everyone, my name is Andrew Grotzinger and we're going to be talking today about the shared genetic architecture across psychiatric disorders. I'm going to break up my talk into five sections, starting with the comorbidity problem more generally and how family studies have been used to understand comorbidity, and then move on to talk about how genomic methods have been used more recently to understand comorbidity, starting with the genome Y level analysis, followed by at the genetic variant level and ending with mechanistic studies. And then we'll wrap up by talking about about next steps in cross-disorder efforts. So beginning with the comorbidity problem in family studies, I'm starting here by showing all individuals with mental disorders in this blue space. And among that lump of people, about two thirds will meet criteria for a second disorder in their lifetime, 51% will meet criteria for a third disorder, and 41% will meet criteria for a fourth disorder, indicating some pretty large shared pathways across these disorders. Proband studies or family studies that are often depicted using this schematic over here with the parents on the top and the offspring on the bottom have identified reciprocal relationships across a number of disorders. And by reciprocal relationships, I mean that the offspring is at risk for not just the disorder present in the parent, but also this alternative disorder. And these relationships have been identified for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, bipolar disorder and major depression, autism and bipolar and schizophrenia and a general shared liability across major anxiety disorders, indicating that these disorders in general do not read true. In this 2012 study, they looked at these five disorders in the parents on the x-axis, and the odds ratio of the child developing a particular disorder on the y-axis with the null at one in this red dashed line. And what they find consistent with those proband studies is that the children were at risk for really any disorder and not just the disorder present in this parent. Twin studies have been used to follow up on these findings by looking at specific genetic correlations across disorders, which is shown here on the bottom half of this matrix from this smaller review paper in 2019. One thing I want to draw your attention to is that a lot of these cells are listed as NA, and that's because for a twin study to estimate the genetic correlations across these disorders, both disorders would have to be present in one of the twins. And because a lot of these disorders are really pretty rare or even mutually exclusive, this is often not possible. Whereas for genomic methods in blue here above the diagonal, you'll see that genetic correlations are estimated across the psychiatric space. And that's possible because using genome-wide methods such as bivariate LD score regression introduced in this Nature Genetics paper in 2015, we're able to estimate genetic correlations across samples with varying degrees of sample overlap, including mutually, including mutually exclusive samples, such that the samples can themselves be independent and now you can look at the genetic correlations for these more rare disorders that are unlikely to be measured in the same sample. Given high rates of genetic correlations across the disorders, this motivated us to develop genomic structural equation modeling, which we introduced in this Nature Human Behavior paper, which is a framework for modeling the patterns of genetic associations across different constellations of traits. I wanna go now through the different iterations of factor modeling we've done using genomic SEM for psychiatric disorders, starting with this initial factor model we fit in that Nature Human Behavior paper for these five major disorders where we identified this overarching P factor. We called it P in part bit just because it was a placeholder, given that we only had these five disorders were sufficiently powered to include in the model at the time, which is something we wanted to improve upon in future iterations, which we were able to do in this 2019 cell paper for the second major cross disorder effort, where we examined the multivariate architecture across these eight disorders to identify a compulsive, psychotic, and neurodevelopmental disorders factor. We've updated that model still further to include these additional three disorders shown in red for this Met Archive preprint in 2020, where with the inclusion of these three disorders, we're now pulling out this fourth internalizing disorders factor that maps on pretty nicely to a lot of the phenotypic factor modeling work that's been done for psychiatric disorders. And I would highlight too that for a lot of these disorders, we have updated sample sizes, but are still pulling out those same compulsive psychotic and neurodevelopmental factors from the cell paper. There's some caveats to keep in mind when interpreting the genetic and the corresponding factor models. One being that genetic correlations are only going to be equivalent across genomic and family-based methods when the genetic correlations are constant across rare and common variants. And that's because LD score regression is estimated using relatively common alleles with a minor allele frequency greater than 1%. So if that clustering really changes at the rare variant end of the spectrum, which is certainly possible, then that's something that's going to shift those factor models as well. And it's something that remains to be examined in future work. It's also important to keep in mind that genetic correlations can be upwardly biased in two main cases. The first being when GWAS studies utilize supernormal controls, 
which refers to instances when the controls are not simply screened for the disorder of interest, but also for related disorders, which, gonna, which is going to induce a dependency between that screen disorder when estimating genetic correlations. They'll also be upwardly biased when misclassification is present, so when a related disorder is accidentally classified as the disorder of interest, which will then also induce an upward bias correlation. Although simulations indicate that extremely high rates of misclassification would be needed to explain the current pattern of findings. So in general, I think given both of these two points, we should treat the genetic correlations as a sort of upper bound of what's likely present in the population, but it's something that's really an interpretive limitation, not something that should cause us to completely throw out the results. I want to talk now about genetic variant level of analyses with respect to GWAS and cross disorder efforts, starting with the first cross disorder paper in 2013, where they examined five major disorders across um, over 33,000 cases and 27,000 controls to identify four hits, which has expanded rapidly in the 2019 cell paper to now include eight disorders in over 230,000 cases and almost half a million controls to now identify over 109 pleiotropic loci. Using a fixed effects meta-analysis in genomic stem, we also examined um, pleiotropic loci across the 11 disorders and identify 184 pleiotropic loci, including 69 of the 109 CDG2 loci, which points to the replicability of those findings. In this Manhattan plot, I'm showing hits both with black and red triangles, where black triangles reflect hits that were in LD with the univariate hits, and red triangles indicate novel loci relative to the univariate GWAS, which highlights the ability of cross-disorder efforts not just to unpack the genetic variants underlying comorbidity, but also to leverage shared power across the traits to identify new hits and novel discovery. We also looked at multivariate GWAS in the context of SNPs acting on those factors, where on the top half of these AMI plots, we have the SNP effects on the factor, and on the bottom half, what we call in genomic stem Q SNP, which indexes heterogeneity across the indicators that load onto that factor. So Q SNP really identifies disorder specific effects. So for these results, we find 132 hits in LD with individual hits, 20 novel loci, and nine highly disorder specific hits, which again points to another benefit of cross disorder efforts, which is to identify not just pleiotropic loci but loci that also underlie phenotypic divergence or cause disorders to seem really dissimilar as they present. I wanna to briefly touch on the different types of pleiotropy that we should consider when thinking about what these cross disorder hits are picking up on. The first being horizontal or true pleiotropy, in which case a single genetic variant or gene affects two disorders. The second being vertical or mediated pleiotropy, in which a gene affects a disorder and then that disorder then goes on to affect a second disorder. So it's part of this sort of causal cascade. While the general rates of horizontal and vertical pleiotropy remain to be tested within psychiatric disorders, in general, we find for human complex traits that there tends to be a mix of both, which likely also holds for the psychiatric space. One way to examine vertical pleiotropy is using um, Mendelian randomization, which is something we also did with that 11 disorder paper, where we used eight instruments, eight SNPs as instruments for alcohol use disorder, to examine this causal cascade of vertical pleiotropy and indeed find causal effects of alcohol use disorder on bipolar and major depression in this model using those eight SNPs as instruments. A third type of pleiotropy is spurious pleiotropy, um, which will often occur when diagnostic misclassification is present, which is highly relevant for psychiatric disorders given rates such as 15% misclassification across bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. But I want to highlight that it can be kind of unclear what misclassification means given really high rates of genetic overlap. So if we take this theoretical distribution of bipolar disorder, genetic risk in red and schizophrenia risk in blue, it's unclear what the correct diagnosis would be for someone here in the middle in purple. And I think that's something that we can begin to move past in terms of um, how we think about this problem using symptom level data, which I'll touch on at the end. But before that, I want to talk about mechanistic studies, or what's often referred to as functional studies, um, which in general look to take these hundreds of genetic variants that we're starting to unpack and start to understand the biological picture that's being painted by lumping these genetic variants into different functional categories, such as when or where the genes are expressed. In that cross disorder paper, they have a number of exciting findings, including the result from GTEx that pleiotropic loci are generally enriched in the brain, shown here in blue. 
using spatiotemporal gene expression patterns, they find that pleiotropic loci in this dark blue line are generally enriched during that second prenatal trimester here. And using cell type specific analyses, they find that pleiotropic loci are generally enriched in neurons, but are not as enriched in microglia as indicated by this blue shading. In that 11 disorders paper, we use this new method, stratified genomic stem, that can be used to examine multivariate enrichment, to examine enrichment at the level of those psychiatric factors that I talked about. And we find that for the psychotic disorders factor, that, these, that this factor is enriched within excitatory genes, GABAergic genes, protein truncating variant intolerant genes here in the middle, and in particular is enriched at their intersection, which really gives some understanding of the shared processes for the psychotic disorder factor indicators, namely bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. And would also highlight that in line with the cross disorder two findings, we do not find enrichment in these glial cell categories across any of the factors. So I'm gonna end now by talking about major next steps for cross disorder efforts. One of the main ones being the consideration of more nuanced phenotypes, which can help with some of those, how to classify some of those more mixed presentations that I talked about in the case of bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. And polygenic risk score analyses really point towards why this might be important. So for example, schizophrenia polygenic risk scores have showed a stronger association for bipolar disorder characterized, characterized by mood incongruent psychosis as compared to bipolar disorder without psychosis and with earlier age of onset bipolar, which indicates that certain presentations may be, may be more tightly linked at the genetic level across disorders. There are different methods like boombox that can be used in conjunction with raw genotype data to detect if certain subgroups within a disorder are driving genetic correlations with other disorders. And while initial findings did not find evidence for these subgroups for major depressive disorder, this largely remains to be tested for other disorders. Electronic health records are gonna be an amazing resource moving forward that is gonna give us access to some of that symptom level data that um, with a number of different consortium already underway with that explicit purpose, including eMERGE, PsychEmerge, and the NIH All of Us program. Another major consideration for future cross-disorder genomic efforts is inclusion of the environment, namely because the pattern of overlap across disorders may shift across certain contexts. And by splitting GWAS across different environments or different cohorts, we can examine the stability of these genetic correlations and whether or not certain correlations are really environmentally specific. One particular environment that I think of as relevant is the age of onset for that disorder with respect to the internal biological environment that might be going on at that time. So if we take these um, distributions of age of onset for schizophrenia major depression on the top, you can see these two kind of peaks later in life that might really indicate that there's a really specific sort of biology that's getting activated for genes expressed later in life. And if we split the GWAS for these two disorders within this particular late 40s age bin, we might find that there's a really unique clustering across disorders within that age group. So in general, although our disorders may seem dissimilar in some respects, which has caused us to lump them into these discrete categories, their co-occurrence at high levels much higher than chance really requires us to understand the underlying causes of this overlap. And I would argue that genomics offers a real opportunity to fill in some major gaps in our understanding of this overlap, in part because we can examine the full psychiatric space by using different methods that allow us to examine overlap for often, oftentimes independent samples. And it also allows us to examine this conversion at multiple levels of analysis, including at the genome-wide mechanistic and SNP level analysis. And so with that, I'll just thank everyone for their time.